I want to say to you, welcome home. It is good to have you back. We have several reasons for having this assembly. First, we want to recognize some of our own who have story, stories of bravery, perseverance, hope, and accomplishment. In honoring them, we will also celebrate black history. Another objective is to inspire and motivate. I hope today will be another affirmation that circumstances don't have to stop you from achieving anything that you set out to do. Today is another opportunity for us to continue to grow as a family. When we seek to understand one another, we can continue to break down walls. Finally, I want people from the outside to come into this building any chance that they get. I love you, EC Glass. I am proud of you, and I want others to see what I get to see every day. A special... A special thank you to the other members of the committee. Mrs. Krista Rawls Fanning and Ms. Katrina Ligon are our two equity advocates. Months ago, they both approached me separately to say that they were ready to start planning a black history celebration. They are committed and dedicated to all of our students. I also want to thank Mrs. Jane White. She is an answer to prayer. I have asked for more hours in the day, and she literally provides that for me. There is nothing that she would not do for EC Glass. So for our committee members, an extra special thank you to all of you. Let's give them a round of applause. And now, at this time, the EC Glass Acabellas will kick things off by performing a song that was originally recorded by a true living legend, the one and only Queen of Soul, Miss Aretha Franklin.
it is my distinct honor and privilege to introduce Dr. Linda Woodruff. She's a member of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. She's a lifetime member of the NAACP, a charter member of the Sickle Cell Anemia Association. She's an executive board member of the National Scholarship Service Fund for Negro Students. She's the co-founder for black students on white campuses, and she is one of the first black students to integrate EC Glass High School. Please join me in welcoming home Dr. Linda Woodruff back to EC Glass High School. Good morning. It's great to be home. And um, I'll open my remarks by singing for you our high school, uh, you don't want to hear me sing. I've gotten a negative on that on the front row. So we'll move right along. I, uh, you're supposed to laugh at that, guys. <laughs> Dr. Cardwell will tell you I can't sing. Uh, all I can say is that coming into the auditorium and, of course, coming on stage conjures up deep emotional feelings. I am always awestricken to come back uh, to EC Glass High School. I'm proud to be an alumna. Um, we've spent the last 53 plus years talking about our experience here at EC Glass. Very different than uh, today than it was back in the day. At the ripe old age of 14, I decided that what I needed to do was to join the movement, the civil rights movement, if you will, to desegregate key institutions in our home city of Lynchburg and throughout the state of Virginia. My role, my contribution, was to become one of four litigants' legal lawsuit filed to transfer from the then awesome Dunbar High School to the awesome E.C. Glass High School. So in January, on a cold winter day in 1962, the story began. And Owen Cardwell and I were <clears throat> scheduled to arrive uh, 30 minutes after school had started all by ourselves to enter the magic doors to become hilltoppers. And that we did. We had no idea then, and we still have doubts now about what all that entailed. All I remember is getting out of the car and looking up and all 2,600, it appeared, I'm sure it wasn't, students already enrolled at Glass were looking down and watching us arrive. Now remember, this is age 14. 14. What's going on in a 14-year-old's head? You want it to be A, like everybody else. Well, that wasn't going to happen. B, you want it to fit in. Well, there were about 2,000 rules and regulations that were going to prohibit that. And C, you want it to be liked by everyone. Well, that didn't happen. We were blessed that we safely journeyed through our tenure here at EC Glass, and in June of 1965, with the mighty class of 65, we graduated with fanfare and a lot of success stories. I feel that the experience, my story, that the experiences that we gained here at Glass, times were different. We had no choice. Somebody forgot to put that in the memo before we left Dunbar to come to EC Glass. I assumed that everything I was doing at Dunbar would transfer, like my Latin class, my algebra class, my English class, my science class, right on over to, to Glass. Well, 
What didn't transfer were all of the extracurriculars. We were forbidden to participate in any extracurriculars. I was on my way to being a majorette. I was a majorette at Dunbar in a marching band. That wasn't going to happen. I was uh, assistant to the president of the Student Government Association for our class. No leadership roles at Glass. So again, now remember at 14, we are forming our identity. We are trying to figure out who we are, where we're going. Despite all of the negative, there were positives that evolved over the time that, that I was here. And it gave me certain components to my character that have permitted me to survive to thrive and to excel over all of those 50 years since EC Glass. I am proud. Uh, I am available to you. So if anyone in the audience wants my opinion on anything that I'm competent to give, I will be happy to share. Dr. Richardson will put you in touch if need be. And my story of survival and, and being able to thrive, we had outstanding education here. There were requirements for graduation at EC Glass that literally, literally fed directly into um, the acquisition of the degrees I have. I am a physical therapist by uh, education and training and licensure and I'll never forget sitting down day one in the medical school class and somebody pulls out the anatomy uh, course and I already knew how to spell all of the muscles, all of the bones. I was the only one in my class that did. I could even do latissimus dorsi and sternocleidomastoid because I had it here, believe it or not, in health and physical education in ninth grade. And that's just a silly little story to build that bridge to where my story led. I was confident leaving EC Glass. I was strong beyond measure and old beyond my years based on the experiences that I had here. Today, I am grateful that EC Glass High School was a part of my life, a part of my story. Sometimes, uh, when I was younger, I used to play, what if? What if I didn't leave Dunbar? What if I had never met E.C. Glass High School? What would I be? What would I have done? At my age now, with all of my gray hair in place, I don't play that game anymore. It is what it is, and I'm proud. Thank you for having me. Good morning. It is my honor to take this time and introduce one of our, one of the two African American students to attend EC Glass High School in Lynchburg, Virginia on January 29, 1962. In March of that same year, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came to Lynchburg in support of the desegregation efforts. Once Dr. Owen Cardwell met Dr. King, his life changed. Reverend Owen C. Cardwell Jr. has been in the ministry for 45 years. Dr. Cardwell received a PhD in interdisciplinary studies from the Union Institute and University in Cincinnati, Ohio. His concentration is ethical and creative leadership with a specialization in Martin Luther King studies. He obtained a Bachelor of Arts from the Virginia Seminary and College here in Lynchburg, Virginia a Master's of Theology from the Boston University, a Master's of Education from the Cambridge College. In June of 1997, he received the Honorary Doctorate in Sacred Literature from the Spirit of Truth Institute in Richmond, Virginia Seminary. He has completed course requirements for the PhD in Counseling from the Liberty University here in Lynchburg, Virginia. Could you please join me in welcoming Dr. Owen C. Cardwell, Jr. Wow, I got a chance to hug a pretty woman. I hear the term that Linda and I integrated EC Glass High School and 
the school system in Lynchburg, Virginia. The truth of the matter is that Easy Glass is integrated now. What we did back in 1962 was to desegregate. When I look out at you um, in the audience this morning, I have to echo the words of that great philosopher Urkel. Did I do that? Linda and I were um, 14 years old when we came up the front steps of E.C. Glass High School and three months later, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. came here to support the efforts of desegregation uh, in Lynchburg. He was invited by Dr. Virgil Wood, who was the civil rights leader here in the city at that time. There were no Holiday Inns or Marriott hotels for African Americans to stay in during those days. And so, particularly in the South, when we travel, we stayed in uh, the homes of, uh, of other African Americans. So Dr. King stayed in the home of Dr. George F. Jackson, who was a local dentist. Cecilia, his daughter, was one of the litigants um, in the school desegregation suit. And we had, a, we had an awesome night at Dr. Jackson's house, sat in the floor with Dr. King and sang freedom songs. What I realized um, over the years is out of that experience, I wanted to know more about Dr. King. And so as you um, heard in the reading of my bio, I'm, I'm now a King scholar. I wanted to know about his life, his philosophy, and so now I'm a King Scholar. And one of the things that I came to realize is that um, Dr. King did not become the civil rights icon that he was uh, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial in 1963. That at age 15, he was uh, a participant in an oratorical contest in Dublin, Georgia. Um, it was during the writing of that um, that paper uh, for the oratorical contest that he first developed the notions that were later propelled in the I Have a Dream speech. So he began his journey as a 15-year-old. On the way back on the bus to Atlanta from Dublin, Georgia, the bus driver required that he and the teacher give up their seats so that white persons could sit down. And Dr. King refused to do that, um, but at the insistence of his teacher, because she told him, you're breaking the law, um, he stood up the rest, he and his teacher stood up on the rest of the bus journey um, back from Dublin to uh, Atlanta. He said that it was the angriest he had ever been in his entire life, but he was 15 years old. How many of you know who Claudette Colvin is? Nobody? Nobody? How many of you know who Rosa Parks is? Well, nine months before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus, a 15-year-old single parent by the name of Claudette Colvin refused to give up her seat on the bus. But the Montgomery Improvement Association felt that as an unwed mother, she was not a good image um, to propel the movement, so they did not use her. But that did not stop her at age 15 from doing something heroic. Linda and I were 14 years old when we came up the steps of E.C. Glass High School, and as she described, we really didn't see until later in the day the newspaper, had I, had I known that 2,600 students were hanging out the windows literally to watch us come into the school, I might have changed my mind about getting out of the car. But um, we came into a school with just two of us, 2,600 white students, at a very critical time in our lives, but it didn't stop us from doing something that has, was heroic. You need to understand that the whole design was for us to fail, to come into this situation in the middle of a school year, and the determination between whether all four of us would come at the same time or not 
was IQ scores. Linda and I were deemed to have had IQ scores that were high enough to be able to desegregate EC glass. Mind you, our IQ scores were higher than 97 percent of the students that we were going to be in school with. So Martin Luther King Jr. was 15 when he really launched his heroic journey. Claudette Colvin was 15 when she launched her heroic journey. Linda and I were 14 years old when we launched our heroic journey. I want to challenge you. You don't have to wait until you have made it in some law office or, or a professor in a college somewhere or an engineer to begin to live your life intentionally and heroically. Find a way that you can serve your fellow man, and I challenge you to live life heroically so that 10 years from now, you can be standing on this stage telling your story, encouraging others at EC Glass High School to do the best they can. Thank you so much. Good morning. I am Roger Jones, and while I currently serve as Dean of the School of Education, Leadership, and Counseling at Lynchburg College, I had the great pleasure for eight years to be principal of EC Glass High School one of America's finest high schools. Amen. It is a great school because of a strong administrative team, an outstanding faculty, great students, supportive parents, and a supportive community. It is also a great place because of the staff that work behind the scenes that does and do the little things every day that few people notice. One of the best hires I ever made as principal at EC Glass was a staff position. I hired Mr. Thomas Cardwell as head custodian. Mr. Cardwell was a humble man and a man who always gave you that extra effort. He loved EC Glass and he took great pride in making sure that the building itself represented the Hilltopper community. I became a better person from knowing him. Mr. Cardwell and his wife Jean, who is on stage this morning, encouraged, loved, and supported their children. They obviously set high expectations and their children did not disappoint. One judge, Renee, who is not with us today because of weather, one engineer, Thomas Jr., two attorneys, Kevin and Victor, and one superintendent of schools, Reva. As a 30-year employee of Lynchburg City Schools, former principal of this school, and a taxpayer in the city of Lynchburg, I am very pleased that the Cardwell family is being recognized today. For in the opinion of many of us in the Lynchburg community, they are truly one of the most remarkable families in the city of Lynchburg. There is a spokesperson, Dr. Reva Cardwell Cosby, currently superintendent of schools in Ohio, who will represent the family with her comments. Wow, that was a wonderful introduction and um, we are so humbled to be honored in this way. Um, it's so interesting because our story just took place, started 10 years in EC Glass after the heroic events that happened in 1962. So it, it is interesting and exciting to think that there has been powerful change. Um, and now, of course, we're 40 years from that time. The thing that made the difference for our family, and our story is a little different, it does relate back to our parents. Um, you heard about my father, Thomas Cardwell. Prior to becoming 
the um, head custodian here at EC Glass. My father worked many jobs to get us opportunities. He worked at the foundry and he drove cab and a lot of times he did those things simultaneously. Um, he did whatever it took. My mother also worked and she was such a, a visionary. We actually were talking about it earlier. Um, a lot of us, the five of us are where we are because of a dream that they had. My father did not finish high school. My mother did finish high school, but she did not go on to college. But she used to visit a sister. She used to drive through Charlottesville, Virginia to get to Petersburg, Virginia to visit her sister. And she used to say, my children are going to go to the University of Virginia. They're going to go there. Now, at the time when she was having that dream, we could not have went there if we had wanted to. Times changed as we were in school. And I have to agree, EC Glass provides you with an excellent education. And so when it was time for us to go to school, four of the five of us did go to um, the University of Virginia. And we graduated from there and, of course, went on to further education. My brother Tommy went to Virginia Commonwealth University, and so I'm not going to downplay that there are other great schools in Virginia, but um, he also went to the Navy. So there, there are more than one way to get to where you want to be. But our story, again, is about the students who people may think are, in today's terms, quote, at risk. You know, the only risk is your unwillingness to dream big. That's the risk. You have to find someone who believes in you, and they believe in your dream, and you let them help you and propel you to the greatness that you have. I mean, a lot of us are, are born blessed with talent, with um, creativity, with high IQs. But there are others of us who those things can be honed and skilled and you can become a success and you can make your family and your school proud of you. You can be heroic. I love that Dr. Um, Cardwell said, be heroic in your life. There's nothing stopping you now. We worry that times are in some ways looking like people want to look back and have things like they were maybe in the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s. But don't let that happen. We live in 2016. Get to know your neighbors. Get to know people. Dream big for your own life, for your family, for your community. Take advantage of all the opportunities that are out there. And, you know, if five kids from Monroe Street who had beginnings that may have been another type of ending can make it like we did, I believe everyone in this room can do so as well. So thank you. The personal lessons and benefits our students derive from practices, conditioning, and contest are well known. Teamwork, a sense of belonging, accountability, leadership, commitment, pride and grace and victory, humility and resilience in defeat. This day we look to and recognize three such examples of African American students who have exemplified the definition of an EC Glass athlete, both on the field and off, from high school to college to professional sports and beyond. The first, Dusty Dupre, a 2011 graduate of Glass, was an outstanding female soccer player and a two-time district player of the year an All-Region Player of the Year, and played on the All-State team twice during her time at Glass. In addition, she started for four seasons on the basketball team, exemplifying her dynamic athletic abilities. Desi continued her pursuit of academic and athletic excellence at Lynchburg College. As a freshman, Desi set her personal goal at 100 career goals during her time at Lynchburg, a number prestigious for even the echelon of players. Upon graduation in 2015, Desi had succeeded in surpassing her goal with over 105. Our second and third examples include brothers Reuben and Cornell Brown, who graduated Glass in the early 90s. Reuben Brown graduated from Glass in 1990 and attended the University of Pittsburgh. Though initially Reuben struggled with his freshman coach's insistence that he switch from a defensive position to an offensive tackle, he challenged his aggravation with effort persistence, and humility. These traits allowed him the ability to have a memorable college career, a feat later lauded by his induction into the College Football Hall of Fame in 2015. 
Graduating college, Reuben was drafted 14th overall in the 1995 draft before playing nine seasons for the Buffalo Bills and an additional four for the Chicago Bears, starting in all 181 games he ever played. Reuben let his teammates, his classmates, and all those who knew him as an example of a true athlete. Not to be outdone by his older brother, Cornell Brown, who attended Virginia Tech and received All-American honors twice during his time there, was drafted into the NFL by the Baltimore Ravens in 1997. He played a total of seven seasons in the NFL. He added a Super Bowl ring to his collection of accomplishments in Super Bowl 35 against the New York Giants. Though he retired from professional sports, Cornell served as an assistant coach to the Virginia Tech Hokies and continued to pass on the core sportsmanship values he first learned within these halls. Sports played well and with integrity provide one more public representation of some of the core values of our school system and community. Fairness, civility, and excellence. Traits which I am proud to point out not only in these examples but in the students I see and serve every day. Hi, my name is Desi Dupuy. I graduated from EC Glass in 2011. After Glass, I went to Lynchburg College and played soccer there for four years. Uh, during that time, I was a two-time All-American, broke the career record for goals, and our team in 2014 won the first national championship for the school. The main thing that I gained from EC Glass was how to be a team player. I used that skill in the classroom, on the court, and on the field, and even in every aspect of life, and I still do to this day. My biggest piece of advice would be to work hard, whether it's in athletics, academics, art, music, anything, whatever you're doing, always work hard to get to where you want to go. Even though people always say work hard and whatnot, the reason I picked that as my biggest piece of advice is because it's actually true. Like, the harder you work and the more effort you put into something, the more you're going to get out of it. Thank you EC Glass for keeping me in mind for this special honor and thank you for the memories. Hello, my name is Reuben Brown. I am a former EC Glass uh, student. I graduated in 1990 and I am here to say tell my story, my EC Glass story. And that story began several years ago when I came to EC Glass and attended. Um, and I came in the 10th grade. Uh, it was an exciting new time because I came from Amherst County, Virginia, way out in the, in the country uh, where we didn't have as many resources as there are in Lynchburg. And I truly fell in love with EC Glass, the high school. I fell in love with the people, the teachers, the families, the administrators. And the reason why this school and EC Glass and the Lynchburg community has really been deeply, uh, I would say, inspirational and important to me is because of all the resources that were available to me. Uh, the beauty of EC Glass High School is the fact that there are a lot of kids that come from several different backgrounds that commune to learn and socialize together uh, and become educated at a high level. Uh, I would say I've met and befriended um, young men and women that had financial status that were way beyond that of my own. My family were blue collar workers who struggled for everything they did, needed or, or got, and uh, it was tough on a lot of our resources, but we had a lot of support from the EC Glass and Lynchburg community, and that is really has been an inspiration for me over my years um, since being at EC Glass, going on to the University of Pittsburgh and then on to the NFL for several years playing for the Buffalo Bills and Chicago Bears. But now I live in the Buffalo area and I try, I raised three kids of my own and I speak very highly of my EC Glass days because they are the cornerstone of what I believe and what I've built my life on. So today I say thank you for to EC Glass and the Lynchburg community 
for all they've done for my personal family. That includes my father and mother who both worked in the Lynchburg area, Griffin Pike um, Company and the U.S. Post Office there, my uh, two sisters and brother, Danita Brown, uh, Angela Brown, and you all know my brother Cornell Brown, who also was a high school alumni at EC Glass. And we're very proud to be honored amongst uh, so many other great individuals at this assembly. Uh, there's more to my story. I encourage all of you young students in the uh, EC Glass school system to look that story up. Ask some of the teachers, principals, administrators there that remember the days that myself and my brother attended the school. Ask about that time. You will be amazed to know the great camaraderie and family, I would say love, that the whole community shared at that particular time in the early, uh, I would say, or late 80s into the early 90s. Um, I had great teachers. Um, like I said, um, I would mention one teacher in particular, Phyllis Hicks, who did a lot of mentoring and teaching for a lot of the athletes that were um, going through EC class at the time. Um, I won't even get into saying many more names because there are too many that served there and did an outstanding job to make EC Glass the great school that it is today. So thank you guys for this honor and I hope my words inspire some of you who are attending, going to classes, walking the same halls that I did many years ago. So good luck to you. Good morning. My name is Aaron Reed, and I am a 1994 graduate of EC Glass High School. I am an English teacher, as well as the coach of the awards-winning forensics program here at EC Glass. I have the very great honor of introducing one of your own peers to you today. When she graduates here in June, Michaela Warwick, will be attending the University of Pennsylvania on a full QuestBridge scholarship augmented by a very generous, generous Horatio Alger scholarship renewable each for four years. She is the product of Lynchburg City Schools having attended Robert S. Payne Elementary School and Linkhorn Middle. That's how important she is. When Michaela walked into my door as a freshman in homeroom four years ago, three and a half years ago, I knew that she was bound for something great. What I really knew was that she and I, when she graduates here in June, would have certain memories that we shared. I knew that we would both love the poetry and literature that Patty Worsham shares in her classes every day. I knew that she and I would be survivors of Rod Camden's calculus class. But I knew that we would also hold diplomas from this same institution. It is my very great honor to introduce to you Michaela Warwick. Good morning, EC Glass. <laughs> Doesn't it sound like I'm going to do the morning announcements? No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> In part, this assembly commemorates the rich history found at EC Glass, as seen by the wonderful speakers that we've heard from today. Can we all give them a round of applause? <laughs> I'm so inspired by your stories. But also, this assembly acknowledges something I think is vital and pertinent to every student in this room. Tell Your Story, the theme of this assembly and a news article published about me back in February, is essentially the same message as be authentic to yourself. In that, I mean no one in this world is the same as you. That means your passions and your dreams are uniquely yours. And the way you obtain those dreams is also uniquely yours. Many falsely believe that doing A, B, and C will get you X, Y, and Z. But that's not always the case. Sometimes you have to play connect the dots, and what you get at the end isn't a pretty perfect picture. But all that matters is you get to the point at the end that you strive for, and that point is different for everyone. 
The continuity found in all measures of success, no matter how you define the word, is hard work. In most cases, one doesn't simply wake up, breathe the air, and achieve significant feats. This Black History commemoration is a testament to that. All of these individuals honored here today had to fight against some type of adversity, be it societal or internal or laws themselves holding them back. But they overcame, and they are here today to tell us their stories. How inspiring is it to see how much things have changed? how black students and white students and Asian and Hispanic students can sit here today in our own pursuits for personal excellence. Now this hard work that I speak of isn't easy. If I speak from personal experience, I know that there are nights when I don't get much sleep trying to keep everything in balance. And I imagine nights like this will happen in the future. I don't recommend that for everyone. But what I do recommend is finding something that keeps you focused on your goal, whatever that may be. I look into this auditorium and I see a wide array of kids. Kids who find dreams when they're riding their skateboards or performing on this stage or reading the text in a worn book or painting a picture. And to those of you who don't know what your passion is or what you want to do in life, I can assure you that it exists because no one, no one is purposeless. Another thing I stand for is living for yourself, life, Genuinely taking each day as a new opportunity will make things happen. Just try it. When you look at life that way, stepping out of your comfort zone doesn't seem so menacing. Shedding the limits and expectations placed on you by others doesn't seem so impossible. Being the best person that you can be is all that you can do because yesterday becomes irrelevant. And the point I'm trying to make with that is, if you've been living your life aimlessly, without caring too much or wanting too much for fear that it's unattainable, that doesn't have to continue. And what's so beautiful about EC Glass is that there are so many outlets available for us to explore. I found my passion in theater and forensics and English and studying continuities throughout history. And you can find yours too and use it to give you a voice. So in conclusion, I say remember that everyone in this room is a multifaceted individual who has so much to offer the world. We as students are not our test scores or our lunch ID pin numbers. We are humans who happen to have had the pleasure to cross paths in this wonderful building so full of history, as we saw earlier in the presentation. And as individuals, we must fulfill our duty of living our lives to the fullest, of taking control of what is rightfully ours. No matter where you are in your journey, you are entitled to the success and beauty that lies ahead. So I say, in closing, let's take this school year seriously so we can all go and do the incredible things that I know we're all capable of doing. Thank you. At this time, we will hear from the beautiful songbird, Nia Dyke. <laughs> I don't know. 
blessed wheel Then I go to my brother And I say, brother, help me please But he winds up, he winds up Knocking me Next, we will hear from Ashani Busby, and Ashani will perform an original poem. We get out of school early. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> All right. Um, first, I'm gonna give you a backstory. First thing is, um, my brother Sire. Those of you who know my brother, um, he was blessed with the gift of lyricism, and. I was just fascinated with the way that he could put together words and make people see exactly where he was coming from. And I myself, I was blessed with the gift of song. I can sing. But um, God will always, no matter what it is, God will always give you the desire of your heart. And this is my first poem that I've ever written, and it's the nearest and dearest to my heart, and I hope you all enjoy it. I want to be a spirit that embraces the unknown with the confidence of finding something new. Let me say it again. I want to be a spirit that embraces the unknown with the confidence of finding something new. You will not hear me weep, but you will surely hear me roar, although I am used to weeping with my head bowed and my knees pressed against the floor. Grandmother, Grandma, why do you cry? And why do you mumble this speech called prayer which someone of ignorance would call lies? Is it because you believe in something that is beyond the skies? Something that is as pure as the morning and as deep as the night, the reason my mother cries? See, I was unsure why the devil always chose to try me. Because I believe that in the dark, Ashani B will still be shining with no rings or bling. It's just little old me with plentiful blessings, no use in counting, because then I'm drowning in my anointing. I begged the Lord, please, if you would just let me see. He gave me a little peek. Now all I can do is speak. Speaking to existing you who wasn't listening when the preacher said, listen, write this down. It's a shame because I'm called black and I'm brown and I grew up in Lynchburg. Now, how does that sound? I mean, it's not as bad as you think. Still good times in crime, long nights filled with cups, smokes, and hood rhymes. <laughs> or, or maybe telling myself I'm all right, I'm just fine. I hate to see my mother crying, so I tell her keep trying, keep a righteous mind because it will all come in due time. Time in the making. Time in the making. God has never forsaken. Pray and give thanks all while I'm steady breaking down. Around me I see God's creations being used by Satan and then I start thinking, is that life worth waiting? I don't know. I see my chance and I take it. Ashini B. Thank you. Our final performance will be from the Keith Lee Dancers, and we are proud to have one of our own back with us today, Eliana Lee. Um, Eliana is now at the School of Performing Arts in North Carolina, and so welcome the Keith Lee Dancers. Hello, everybody. How are you today? My name is Keith Lee, and I brought some of my dancers here to perform for you. Dancers? First, we have Nadia Sneed. 
Sydney Campbell, Robin Augie, Caleb Linda Valson, and my daughter Eliana Lee. Thank you, dancers. This is very special to be here today. I put together a program called Keith Lee Dances Honors Black History. The first piece that we're going to do is an excerpt from a full work which is entitled The Scripted Adventures of Chalk and Blackboard. It's the Martin Luther King section. Thank you. And so the first question that the priest asked, the first question that the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the Good Samaritan came by, and he reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? That's the question before you tonight. Yes, sir. Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to my job? Not if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to all of the hours that I usually spend in my office every day and every week as a pastor? The question is not if I stop to help this man in need, what will happen to me? The question is, if I do not stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? That's the question. Let us rise up tonight with a greater readiness. Let us stand with a greater determination. And let us move on. In these powerful days, these days of challenge, to make America what it ought to be, we have an opportunity to make America a better nation. And I want to thank God once more for allowing me to be here with you. You know, several years ago, I was in New York City autographing the first book that I had written. And while sitting there autographing books, a diminished black woman came up. The only question I heard from her was, Are you Martin Luther King? And I was looking down writing and I said, yes. And the next minute I felt something beating on my chest. Before I knew it, I had been stabbed by this demented woman. I was rushed to Holland Hospital. It was a dark Saturday afternoon. That blade had gone through and the x-rays revealed that the tip of the blade was on the edge of my aorta, the main artery. And once that's punctured, you're drowned in your own blood. That's the end of you. It came out in the New York Times the next morning that if I had merely sneezed, I would have died. Well, about four days later, they allowed me, after the operation, after my chest had been opened and the blade had been taken out, to move around in the wheelchair in the hospital. They allowed me to read some of the mail that came in, and from all over the states and the world, kind letters came in. I read a few, but one of them I will never forget. I had received one from the president and the vice president. I've forgotten what those telegrams said. I received a visit and a letter from the governor of New York, but I've forgotten what that letter said. But there was another letter that came from a little girl, a young girl, who was a student at the White Plains High School. And I looked at that letter, and I'll never forget it. It said simply, Dear Dr. King, I am a ninth grade student 
at the White Plains High School. She said, while it should not matter, I would like to mention that I'm a white girl. I read in the paper of your misfortune and of your suffering. And I read that if you had sneezed, you would have died. I'm simply writing you to say that I'm so happy that you didn't sneeze. And I want to say tonight, I want to say tonight that I too am happy that I didn't sneeze because if I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1960 when students all over the South started sitting in at lunch counters. And I knew that as they were sitting in, they were really standing up for the best in the American dream and taking the whole nation back to those great wells of democracy which were dug deep by the founding fathers in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1961 when we decided to take a ride for freedom and ended segregation in interstate travel. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been around here in 1962. The Negroes in Albany, Georgia, decided to straighten their backs up. And whenever men and women straighten their backs up, they are going somewhere because a man can't ride your back unless it is bent. If I had sneezed, The black people of Birmingham, Alabama, aroused the conscience of this nation and brought into being the Civil Rights Bill. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have had a chance later that year in August to try to tell America about a dream that I had had. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been down in Selma, Alabama, to see the great movement there. If I had sneezed, I wouldn't have been in Memphis to see a community rally around those brothers and sisters who are suffering. I'm so happy that I didn't sneeze. And they were telling me. Now it doesn't matter now. It really doesn't matter what happens now. I left Atlanta this morning, and as we got started on the plane, there were six of us. The pilot said over the public address system, we're sorry for the delay. But we have Dr. Martin Luther King on the plane. And to be sure that all of the bags were checked, and to be sure that nothing would be wrong on the plane, we had to check out everything carefully. And we've had the plane protected and guarded all night. And then I got into Memphis. And some began to say the threats, or talk about the threats that were out. Or what would happen to me from some of our sick white brothers. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. Like anybody, I would like to live a long life, longevity, has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. 
uh, that we're going to do is uh, a solo that my daughter has designed, and she starts her journey as a choreographer. The piece is called Untitled. Found me. 